Hi, I'm Greg. And I'm Leanne. Welcome, Welcome to, to the Empowered, Empowered Poly Podcast. Podcast, where we give you the tools to help you feel more empowered in your polyamorous and consensually non-monogamous relationships by sharing what we've learned as relationship coaches and as individuals. Empowered Poly is LGBTQ2IA+, alternative lifestyle, and kink-friendly. Thank you for joining us. And, and enjoy, enjoy the, the show. show. Hi, and welcome to episode 33, where we are going to discuss comparison in consensual non-monogamy. So this comes up a lot with my clients. What about you, honey? Yes, it comes up quite a bit. It's one of the most popular topics, actually. Mm -hmm. So I think right out of the gate, we should identify that there's uh, basically two types of comparison that could be going on, right? Mm -hmm. The comparison yeah. that you have uh with your meta so your partner's partner so you might be thinking oh i know this about them they're better than me in some way um can also be the reverse uh where you feel that you're better <laughs> right so you can have those mm -hmm. superiority feelings and uh and then the other type of comparison that happens is with a hinge partner the person in the middle of two relationships comparing those two people um, mm -hmm. and both of them are problematic <laughs> right yeah we can agree yeah, for sure. that they are problematic yeah for sure they're definitely problematic um i think i think it's impossible not i think it's it's unreasonable to expect us to not have some level of comparison um, i'm sure there are human beings on the planet out there that don't but I think we still do it on some level. I think when it becomes problematic is when you use it as your compass to determine your own value and your own worth. Or in the case of comparing different partners to one another, one partner's value and worth over another. I think that's when it becomes problematic. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, yeah. So when it becomes a question of worth, um, Let's differentiate that then. So I'm comparing myself to my partner and I'm saying uh, they're better than me. So therefore my insecurities are being supported. Mm. Right. Yeah. So that's not going to be helpful to me as I'm trying to sit with those feelings and, and work with myself on them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we'll talk a little bit later about some of the things that you can do to help yourself if you are finding yourself comparing. Um, but it's okay to say, you know, my meta likes to do this activity with my partner and I don't like that activity. And so it, it's not a matter of worth. It's a matter of, I see the difference here. There is a difference and I can see the value in that relationship for them too, right? Like there's an advantage there that maybe you know, um, they don't have in our relationship. We can't go mm. skiing together, for example, but mm. they could go skiing with someone else. And so mm. um, that's a comparison that's, I think, helpful. Mm. Does that work? Well, right. Yeah, I think so. And it's actually funny that you mentioned it because I was just thinking about the fact that comparison can actually be helpful in certain situations. And that's one of them. So there you go. Like, for instance, for using I, you, you and I as an example, um, I like loud, heavy music. You don't. And so I can't, <laughs> I, I won't, you know, you won't go to concerts with me. Right. So I have partners who do go to concerts with me and that's great. It works out. So I guess the question I have is, is, is that comparison or is that just, well, I don't know what that would be, but is that comparison? Acknowledging the differences. I think it is. Comparison, I think, is a form of categorization, like saying these two things are the same or these two things are different. Right. Um, the assumption that those attributes equal somebody's worth, I think, is the problem. Right? Was it the assumption that those attributes equal somebody's worth. Like I all like the... Oh, yeah, so... If I assume that because I don't like loud music and I don't want to go to those concerts with you, that I am worthless or worth uh, not as worthy, right? 
-hmm. That could be my assumption. Might not even be your assumption. <laughs> right. Or it might be your assumption. You might start thinking, well, why am I even with her if she never wants to go to concerts, right? right. Um, so at that point, I would work with somebody to question how and, and in what ways they value the relationship that don't include that, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because when you said that the idea that you don't go to concerts with me then that also brings up, well, what value do I have to you then? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. What value do I have to you as a partner if I can't be a concert partner? If I, so in other words, if you can't do all the things with me, then what's your value to me? And that's mononormative programming, right? Right. 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 And that's, I think that's oftentimes at the root of comparison, mm. especially in non-monogamy, right? Because we're talking specifically about non-monogamy here, right? Yeah. Um, you, you like to use the term, and I love this phrase, comparison is the thief of joy. And it is. It is. And I, I forget where you got it from, or maybe you made it up. I don't know. But No, I didn't um, make it up. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I really love that because it's true. And I think that it's more so true in, in non-monogamy because it can often steal the joy from a, a connection or from a relationship mm -hmm. if you're not careful, right? Yeah. And, and going back to the top, that's where it becomes problematic, I think. Um, yeah. And imagine if both partners in a relationship are doing that. So let's go back to you and I. So imagine that you're, and you don't do this, but imagine that you're thinking, hmm, you know, she's not much of a partner if she won't go to concerts with me <laughs> on the one hand. And I'm also thinking I'm not much of a partner if I don't go to concerts with him. Mm -hmm. That's a double whammy that's going to impact all the behaviors on both sides. And so right. that's really challenging. So it's really important to look at yourself and say, where am I comparing my partners? Where am I comparing myself to my metas? And mm -hmm. where is it helpful in acknowledging differences and advantages and benefits? And where is it unhelpful in equating it to worth? Right. Yeah. yeah. So let's jump in. Let's, let's talk about, so, when we were yes. thinking about doing this podcast, we come in, we came up with some ways that we often compare, um, and we don't even realize it. So let's just run through these. Um, so I'll take the first one. Mm -hmm. So aesthetically, and aesthetically could be anything from the way somebody looks to their fitness level to the way they dress, so their their fashion choices, mm -hmm. right? So those are those are ways that those are that's probably one of the more obvious ways, mm -hmm. right? That person is more handsome than I am, or better looking than me, or you know, traditionally more physically appealing, or that person is, is, appears to be fitter than I am, right? Age um, can play into that too. Age, yeah. Age is a big one, yeah. Um, and, you know, fashion choices. So they seem to be more of a snappier dresser, which then leads into the next one, which is financially. You want to talk a little bit about that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so, there's a bit of overlap, you know, there's, these things can show up in multiple categories, but um, financially it could be that someone has a better car, lives, lives in a nicer neighborhood or a more affluent neighborhood, uh, makes more money, has more expendable income. Sometimes it's more about generosity even than the income that they make, right? Like the intent to spend um, might be available to somebody who has more disposable income. But it can also be part of, you know, somebody's um, attributes if they just really value relationships, put them high on the priority and priority list and they budget for them, right? So they mm -hmm. might be still financially making less, but okay with spending more, right? Right, because they, they, they prioritize it differently. Yeah, and so right. that, that sort of willingness to spend, it could also... Um, impact things like gifts meals out activities like you mentioned concerts they're expensive you know um treating someone to a concert is a big deal these days because you're spending hundreds of dollars often um yeah so if somebody's uh more of a spendthrift they like to save money um it might not matter that they're making more they might just prefer to do things that are less expensive you know, 
They might prefer to hand make gifts or do picnics instead of meals out all the time mm -hmm. because their priority is about saving money. That would be their choice, right? So mm -hmm. um, it's really interesting how finances play a part in relationships and how it can show up in terms of, of impacting someone's insecurities mm -hmm. um, or a sense of worthiness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And so you're comparing, and then you're the hinge and you're comparing meta to, or sorry, partner to partner. And you're thinking, well, this partner has more, um, more money or uh, what is it? What's it called? More, um, disposable uh, income. Thank you. More, more disposable income than this partner. So maybe I'm going to want to spend more time with the partner with more disposable income. Well, one of the things that I think would be a healthy take on that would be understanding your partner's uh, financial priorities and, mm -hmm. and supporting them in that mm -hmm. contributing to the picnic. If that's how they want to roll, um, you know, coming up with the least expensive way to have a date, if that's how they prefer to, you know, be financially in the world or if they need to be that way in the world, right? Um, yeah. Understanding that, supporting it, getting behind it, and not thinking of it as a problem necessarily, but as mm -hmm. a, another way of expressing your connection. Right, exactly. It's yeah. just another uniqueness in the connection. Yeah, and then also, you know, um, if you have a partner who has more disposable income and they're able to treat you to going out, um, as a hinge partner, sometimes you might feel some guilt in like accepting those larger gifts if you're not used to that, or if if you're if you make less money, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you have to kind of come to an agreement with that person about their willingness to spend, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, um, and be honest with yourself about your limited resources financially. Like, what can you contribute? If they want to get a hotel room, can you contribute? Yeah. Right. I just had a thought about another way that that I think falls under financially mm -hmm. is gifts. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're out with. So let's say you have a nesting partner, um, and you go out with your non-nesting partner, and your non-nesting partner gives you a gift, and then you bring that gift home, and then so your nesting partner goes, "Where'd you get that?" And you say, well, it was a gift from my partner, from so-and-so. And they're mm -hmm. immediately going to be maybe possibly going into a comparison mode. Well, do I give them enough gifts? Do I give them enough? Like, are my <laughs> gift, do my gifts matter too? Like, like that's a pretty special gift. Like, that's expensive. I know how much those things cost, mm -hmm. right? You know, um, and I can't afford to do that. So does that mean that that person is more valuable to them than I am? Or, right? so that could be, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. That could be one of the ways. And I know you're, are you going to say the opposite or, no. you know, no, okay. I was going to, I was just going to say, or they've given them a gift that you wanted to give them Oh yeah. and maybe can't, can't afford. Right. Oof. Right. Oof. Oof. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. Oof. Yeah. That's a tough one. Or maybe they make them something that you're unable to make, but you've always wanted to try. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, food or something. I just, you know, you're not, maybe I'm just not a good cook. And my other partner is, and they made you this delicious meal and you brought some of it home and it smells really fucking good. And I want to eat all of it, but I'm not going to, because I hate myself and I hate my meta right now. Right. You know, because <laughs> they're such good cooks, you know? Yeah. So you yeah. go down that spiral. Right. So that's, yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah. I also wrote down the word competitive. This isn't something that we talked about, but I think co competition, being competitive is a form of comparison as well. Sure. What do you think? What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, think about all competitive activities, right? All of them have a foundation of comparison. I'm faster than you. I'm yeah. stronger than you, right? Right. Although the best uh, way to look at, I think, competitiveness is maybe to, to be the best that you can be. Right. And also right? find the fastest and strongest person because when the zombie apocalypse comes, <laughs> you want them to be your friend. So. That's right. <laughs> Fill yeah. your polycule with good um, zombie apocalypse uh, people who have skills. Right. <laughs> That's right. You need, you, need, 
you need a smart one, you need a funny one, you need a who strong can sell, one. Who can sew, who can cook, who can, sew, who can, who can forage, cook, right? Who can forage, <laughs> right? right? Who can be a leader, right? You know, right. right? A couple of our yeah. new best friends can axe throw, so we're there good. There you go. See? <laughs> Done. Sold. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, yeah, so I think competitiveness plays a role. I, I don't know if it's, I don't know, uh, you could probably speak to this better in terms of you know, from a female perspective, but from the male perspective, it certainly plays a very large role. Like if I, you know, going back up to aesthetically, if I see somebody who's much fitter, like one of your partners is fitter than I am. And it's, it's, it can be a bit disconcerting sometimes. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I can relate. <laughs> on you? Yes. Oh, can you, can Come you on. relate? Are you yeah, kidding you can, me? You know, you can this. relate. I'm yes, sure people have heard this story, but, um, but yeah, you've dated very fit people, younger people. Um, a lot of that physical comparison comes up for me, aesthetic right. comparison. Yeah. Right. So let's keep going. Let's, there's more, yeah. but there's but more, wait. but wait, there's more. The so spiritually, yep. <laughs> um, someone might be, uh, Fuck you when you're Zen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Someone might be more able to engage in like daily practices of yoga, meditation, prayer, whatever it is that, that you, you know, define as spiritual. Um, they might have more mindfulness. They might be coming across as more enlightened or more even well-read in the spiritual realm. Yep. I just want to point something out that, that, that's a perception right if mm -hmm. you that's not necessarily somebody saying hey i'm more enlightened because typically if somebody's saying they're more enlightened they aren't actually more enlightened <laughs> so <laughs> so just a just a little yeah. uh little little clue in there at least in my experience anyway but if you perceive somebody to be more enlightened than you that's definitely a perspective thing mm -hmm. so yeah i just want to point that out and what you're saying then is personal perspective isn't truth it's right. Mm -hmm. It's wow. That's I love that. I love the way you uh, uh, distilled that down into that personal uh, perspective. I'm writing it down. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Write that down. There's. I feel a blog post coming. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, what you mentioned? I have another one. Mindfulness. What? About spirituality. Yeah. Uh, they might have a bigger spiritual community or connection to a spiritual community that you don't have. So that might feel intimidating or daunting or like they have more uh, worth in that community. And I actually just thought about something. So obviously these are the ways that we've seen comparison show up, mm -hmm. right? And so some of these things have, have impacted us personally and some of them we see professionally. And so we're going to let you figure out which is which that's up to you, but you know, but but the point is, is that maybe you're sitting here listening to this list and thinking, yeah, but what about this? And what about that? I want to hear about those things. Yeah. Reach out to us directly. Let us know how you find yourself comparing. Let us know, you know, what what ways show up for you. And we'll probably reiterate this at the end of the podcast, too. But just to note that this is from our lens, from our experience, right? Our perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and so there might be other perspectives, definitely other perspectives out there. So just keep that in mind and throw them at us. Send us emails, um, make comments in, in, in the, you know, in the, in the section, whatever, wherever you're listening to this. All right, so moving on. Um, so emotionally, um, this one actually is a big one for me personally mm -hmm. um, because as somebody who struggled with emotional regulation most of my life, um, I tend to, this one's pretty high up on the list for me. Yeah. Um, so I, I tend to see people who are able to manage their, jealousy or even feel compersion or being more supportive of their partners or they're easier to get along with i tend to see those people as better than me mm -hmm. um, people that don't feel jealousy at all i tend to see those people as better than me mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough when i'm when i'm comparing or when i have compared like partner to partner i tend to see the person that doesn't feel jealousy as more of a threat than the person that does Ooh, do you know why? Do I know why? Yes. Tell us. Yes, because, well, because the person that doesn't feel jealousy in my mind, even though I know it's not true, 
what, what's happening is there are parts of me that, that perceive that as they don't care as much. And the person that does show jealousy, does struggle with jealousy, that's mononormative programming telling me in all the romance movies and novels and books and songs and everything that I've ever read, that's the person showing me that they care. Mm -hmm. Now, I know intellectually that that's not true. In fact, I know intellectually the chances are that the other way around is going to be more, more of a healthy way to relate. But Maybe. there are parts of Not me, necessarily. Are, yeah, true. But there are parts of me that that definitely feel that that draw to want to stay away from the person that doesn't feel jealousy because it's 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 an unnatural thing for me <gasps> oh something just occurred to me what so when we opened up i had a lot of primal panic when you started dating and i was monogamous there was probably a lot of affirmation in that that i cared <laughs> it's a demonstration in that mononormative way of care right as I, as I started to open up myself and have other relationships and I could see the truth in what you were telling me, which is I can care about this person and you, and it doesn't change my feelings for you. Mm -hmm. My nervous system settled down and I stopped feeling as jealous. So you can even compare you, your partner sort of back then to how they are now and have feelings mm -hmm. come up around that comparison too. And well, also yourself, right? Well, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that because in that same experience, I was having the opposite happen, which was the more, the more you were leveling out, the more heightened I was becoming. Right, right. Because, because what was normal and what I got used to was no longer around. And as you were becoming more level-headed and more... Like, oh, yeah, it is possible to care for and love two other pe you know, two people at the same time or multiple people. Um, I'm over here going, well, what happened to all of that? What happened to all of the the jealousy? What happened to all of the the stuff that you were showing me? Where did that go? And so it 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 created some instability for me as well. Mm, right? yeah. And then I had to level out, too. Right. And so then I was comparing you to who you yeah. are now versus who you were then. And I found myself liking the then more than the now, right. at least at that time. But once you felt I felt more secure it, with the then because you knew there was fear of loss. That's right. That's right. So for me, one of the ways I compare is that fear of loss. Interesting. It, the more you fear losing me, the more valuable I become to you. Right. And are you working on unraveling that? I am. Yeah. How's it going? Uh, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard uh oh, i don't I, that's a that's a whole other podcast but oh. yeah it's, it's it's challenging work um and what i've come to recognize is, is of course that intellectually i know it's all bullshit but there are definitely there's definitely stuff in there that needs to be processed and and worked through and some some areas some blind spots in there for sure um yeah but i but and we're going to get through this list here but um as our listeners already probably know, we tend to kind of go off on tangents and stuff. So here we go. <laughs> Walk with me for a bit down this road. Um, so then there's that comparison piece that gets turned on to you. Right? So now I'm comparing myself to a previous version of myself. Mm -hmm. Right? And so then it's like, well, did I, did I, was I healthier then? Am I healthier now? Like, you know, like, it's just, yeah, it's crazy. Crazy. I so, had some pictures of me come up the other day that mm -hmm. were, that were like, um, from three or four years ago where I was super fit and skinny and all that other stuff. And I am not skinny right now. Um, and I, I immediately went into a little bit of a spiral. Yeah. yeah. So I was comparing myself and I was like, wait a minute, this is how my, my wife met me. And so she must love me this way and not really love me this way. Mm -hmm. as i am now right and so that was comparison thing yeah i know but it had nothing to do with you we just talked about this this morning in the reverse for me right. that i used to be rounder which is a type that you like and i've lost weight and so that's a hard thing for me right to to compare myself yeah so here's 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 the deal right we got to un unravel that by saying uh we feel that this is connected to worth 
but that's the that's the foundational lie that we're telling ourselves that's right right that's right and it's all perception it has nothing to do with reality yeah. um in fact if i mean if your if your partner is making it clear that they don't like you the way that they are that's a them problem not a the you way problem. that you are you mean the way yeah the way that you are that's a that's a them problem and not a you problem that's not something that you need to fix about them or about yourself mm -hmm. frankly it's it's about them and and their narratives and how you know how they perceive themselves and and the world around them and unfortunately there's not a whole lot you can do about that um, yeah correct but yeah so it's interesting how that that shows up um yeah, and I guess that kind of leads naturally into the next one, which is physically and sexually. So do you want to talk about that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, physically and sexually. So these are two different things, but because physical and sexual capabilities can be kind of uh, the same conversation, I put them together. Um, so if you have a, a meta that has more capacity to do certain things, more stamina, more energy, more vitality, more spoons, if you know the spoon theory, um, yeah. you know, if, if they uh, don't have the same kind of chronic conditions that you have to deal with, um, they might be uh, someone with a higher libido. They might be somebody who has an interest in certain sexual activities that your partner is interested in doing. And sometimes we compare, even if we don't want to do those things, which is hilarious mm -hmm. to me, um, mm -hmm. not a hilarious in a, like I'm laughing at you, but I'm laughing with you because I've been there. Uh, it's like, <laughs> well, mm, but I want to do that too, but I don't really want to do that too, but I want you to want to do that with me and then have so me reject can... you. <laughs> and so I can feel better about myself. I don't know. Uh, it's all very complex. Um, somebody might be more physically, um, endowed in some way, um, that makes them more sexually attractive in your mind. Right. And in your partner's mind, frankly, like the, the truth of it is, is that some of these comparisons will be true that acknowledging the differences is okay. We can acknowledge differences and still not tie them to our worth or their yeah. worth. Right. right. That's that's the whole key of this entire podcast. Mm -hmm. We just keep coming back to it. Um, right. and again, age might play a part in all of those things in terms of capacity and stamina and endurance and capability and and interest in certain activities. Right. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. I just had something pop up when I when you were talking and that was um. If we're comparing ourselves to others, are we actually comparing ourselves to ourselves? Some previous version of ourselves. I know that I've done that. So I've seen somebody who is fitter or faster or, you know, whatever, right? And I'm like, I used to be like that. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it can be both. I don't think it has to be both, but I think it can be. I, I think, yeah, I think it can be both. And sometimes just being aware of that, it's not really about them. It's about you. Mm. Right. You're comparing yourself to a version of yourself that's no longer around. Right. So oh, God. Yeah. Be... Right. So as someone with age, chronic conditions, right. Mental, mental health concerns. Um, I have all the time compared myself to my former self. Yeah. Right. Coming to terms with who I am now is it's a huge part of why I'm still in therapy you know, I uh, love, love therapy for that because I'm still processing uh, my lack of capabilities in many areas mm -hmm. as someone with a disability, right? And so mm -hmm. I'm dealing with that. And then my anxiety, I never used to have regular anxiety. It's regular and it's, it's fairly pronounced now in certain circumstances. So, um, you know, that comes up for me in a way that I've never known before, before the accidents that I had in 2018 and 2020. And so those, those things have changed. And I, and I often compare myself to the, my younger days, my pre-accident days, my, you know, higher capacity days and long for that. But in that longing, there's grief and I'm processing that, that level of grief too. 
which I think is good. You know, it's okay to, to lose uh, capacity in certain circumstances and to grieve that and to say that happened to me, that's valid. But what we, we don't want to do is we don't want to spiral in that, right? Where we're beating ourselves up for being different now. We need to get to a place where this is still wonderful and, and something that we accept about ourselves, wherever we're at. Meet yourself where you're at. Yeah. And then the last one here is uh, mentally. So s smarter, more educated, funnier, more socially adept, right? Those are all ways that that could show up too. Somebody is knows more about a certain topic that you mm -hmm. are interested in or knows more about a certain topic that your partner is interested in. Oh, yeah. That you might not have any interest in. And it kind of goes back to what you said earlier about, about um, you know, you may not be interested in it, but you still find it threatening because you want to be able to be like, no, I don't want to do that, but I don't want you to want to do that either. Right. You know, so it's like, or I know you love that and I want to know more about it. I just can't retain it. You know, right. it just, it doesn't, just stick. doesn't interest me. Yeah. It doesn't <laughs> interest me at all. Right. That's yeah. like me with music, right? Like I love music. Music is, is life for me. And but, I can't remember the name of a band. Like I right. can remember the name of a song if I'm lucky. <laughs> right. I have to sing the well, whole I, thing. <laughs> yeah. And, and I have people in my life, friends and partners alike that, that are very much into music. Yeah. And so that, that feeds that need for me, but there might be a part of you that's like, I wish I could do that. Absolutely. Right? You know, and there's a bit of envy in there too. Right. In this yeah, comparison. Yeah. Right. Right. That's a good one. Yeah. Envy and jealousy. Right. There's the different. Um, so yeah. So just, I, I mean, those are, so like we said, those, those are kind of some of the ways that we were able to, to to see that comparison can show up mm -hmm. um, in, in our lives and the lives of some of our clients and stuff. And so we also want to make sure that you like you said, if if there are other ways that it's shown up for you or there are stories that you have to share or tell, please feel free to reach out to us either via email or in the comments and, and let us know. Mm, I want to so, bring up something that's not on our little paper. What? You I know. Script? I know. You do it all the time. Yeah. So this is going to be interesting. No, no, it's uh, <laughs> it's actually from Pollywise, uh, the new Ooh. book from Jessica Fern and her life partner and uh, restorative justice facilitator, David Cooley. Um, <laughs> that just came off my tongue with no problem in this Good podcast. <laughs> the last podcast, it was harder to say. But <laughs> so anyway, they bring up um, what they call justice jealousy which is where you have asked for a certain behavior or something from your partner for a long period of time and they are seemingly incapable of giving it to you and so you make peace with that and you accept that about the relationship i'm not going to get that from my partner and then they get a new partner and they start behaving in that way with them mm -hmm. and it's a form of envy, I think, but they're they're terming it justice jealousy, where it feels unjust. I have worked for years to try and get you to do A, B, or C, and now you're doing all that with them, right? So that kind of comparison can really undermine the foundation of a relationship and cause quite a rupture. It creates a lot of resentment. Yeah, a lot of a lot of anger. Sometimes. We need to get curious around that. So I have an example from our lives together, if you don't mind me sharing. Sure. Um, so at one point you had a partner coming over to the house and your area that you wanted to like spend time together in is where you play records and it's our basement area. And the hallway down to the basement area had been uncovered, um, it's not finished, plastic with insulation showing for a long time. And we had talked about getting different kinds of coverings for it over the years. What should we do? Should we get like a something that we can plaster up there? Should we actually put drywall? What do we want to do? How much do we want to invest, et cetera, et cetera. So it had been an ongoing conversation, but nothing had been done. And then when this meta was coming to the house, you got busy one afternoon and created this entire wall out of fabric, which is beautiful, by the way. And I 
saw that and went, this is fantastic. And why now? <laughs> oh. Why now when all this time we've been talking about it? Now, we, uh, we debriefed this. I don't know if you remember this. I remember, I remember the incident, but I don't remember the debrief per se. Well, the debrief went something like me saying, this is great. It's beautiful. What a nice job you did. And I'm feeling a little put out that you're doing this for her and didn't do it for me. So this was justice oh. jealousy. And what you said was, I had the time and I had the tools and I had the idea and I had some motivation because she was coming over. Yes. But I knew that you were going to be very pleased with the ultimate result. And that mattered to me. And because you phrased it that way, I was like, I can see that she had a part in this, her arrival, but that wasn't the biggest part. The biggest part was you were inspired. You had, you had an idea, you had, you knew how, what you wanted to achieve and how to achieve it. And you were excited to share that with me and that you knew I was going to be happy with the result. And so by getting curious about your motivations, I heard the whole story hmm. and it made me feel much better. You know, it mattered to me that I was a big part of that equation. Mm -hmm. You know, Good. Good. so thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, yeah. What would you say to 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 somebody who 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 is suffering from that justice jealousy, or sorry, experiencing justice jealousy, mm -hmm. but it had nothing to do with them? Like, so for instance, the behavior wasn't even didn't even involve them, right? So I, I can't. I mean, I I don't know. Um, they've always wanted to go to Disneyland, mm -hmm. but the partner's been like. I hate Disneyland. I hate Disneyland. I can't stand Disneyland. I hate Disneyland. And then all of a sudden, they're booking a trip to Disneyland with this new partner. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that person? Well, first, I'd validate their feelings. <laughs> That's disappointing and creates a bit of resentment for sure. So I would, I would also, I would also suggest they that they ask their partner about what their what the difference is for them in terms of why they would choose this particular destination when I was under the impression or they were under the impression that they didn't like it. So the reason why is because the getting curious part can give you a better picture like in our story, right? There might be extenuating circumstances. Maybe Disneyland is a destination that your Meta's child wants to go to. And they're accommodating the child's desire to go, as well as having a trip together. So maybe it's not about going to Disneyland so much for your partner as it is going on a trip. Mm -hmm. And it could be anywhere. It just happens to be Disneyland mm -hmm. and they're willing to put up with Disneyland to make the child happy and to fulfill their dream of going. Um, or maybe it's a situation of, I didn't realize that you wanted to go to Disneyland that badly, that it was like a, a, a destination preference for you. Right. Maybe you'd only talked about it once or twice, um, but you're remembering it as we always talked about going to Disneyland and you always said no, right? We get into those hy hyperbolic perceptions <laughs> where like we talked about it 10 years ago, we talked about it five years ago, and now maybe they have a different attitude. Maybe five years ago, going to Disneyland seemed stupid, childish. But they've done some growth and they've embraced their child inside and they want to experience Disneyland with that new part of them active and, and flourishing, right? right. So Maybe, what you're saying is... Yeah, there's so, so many what you're reasons. Saying, yeah, there's so many yes. other reasons um, that they could make that decision or that choice that don't involve you. Right. And, and the 
the the the justice jealousy is it's all about me they didn't do it with me and now they're doing it with someone else so i must not be worth their time or their attention yeah or worse it's a big fuck you to you right like <laughs> a, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah here's a, here's a big giant fuck you sandwich yeah you know yeah. right and and that could possibly be true too at which point then you have but but without without that conversation without getting curious you're going on assumptions you're going on on you know the stories that you're telling yourself and there may not be any truth to them mm-hmm. and so i think i think what you're saying is is and and what we would advocate for is is that you get more information that you ask your partner instead of making those assumptions right it could also be a situation and we had a small talk about this this morning too where sometimes <laughs> your your behavior has inadvertently created um behavior in them so for example if every time your partner gets excited or childlike about something you shut them down and tell them to calm down they might feel like that that playfulness isn't expect uh isn't supported by you so going to disneyland would be a big drag they don't want to go to Disneyland and not play and have fun and be silly yeah. and just walk around and be adults. They want to go and be like a child, you know? And, and so maybe their new else. partner, yeah, maybe their new partner embraces that about them, encourages yeah. that about them, right? I mean, yeah. I think we've both been in relationships where we've been very adult and and found that restricting yeah. and yeah, even been sure. made fun of. For sure. Shut down when we tried to play. Right. By the way, all of these these scenarios and these maybes apply to any of this. Any of this. This is to, these are just examples, right, that we're using. But any of these things could be true in any one of these situations. You could take, you know, the person has a bigger house than I do. Or, you know, or you could take any. You know, mm-hmm. they 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 wear better clothes than I do, or they're more fit, or they're you know, richer or whatever, all of these things, they're all just stories that you're telling yourself until you get curious with your partner about what matters to them and why, you know, why they're making the decisions that they're making. Right. And sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Who cares? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, who cares if their house is bigger? Who cares if their dick is bigger? Like it doesn't matter. Right. Sometimes it's just, it's just, it's just people are different and they have different things and different priorities. Size isn't everything. <laughs> right? I like how yeah. you leaned in on that one. Yeah. yeah. It's really important. It's really important. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, and things, the story behind why they have that, that well-paying job could be a lot of pressure that they put on themselves to be the provider for their kids and their family and, and extended family. Uh but that also steals time away from their relationships. Right. And so there's advantages and disadvantages, like big, bigger picture thinking. Interestingly enough too, when it comes to like jobs and houses and cars and all that shit too, Mm -hmm. we make tons of assumptions about people who have those things just -hmm. because they have a car, an expensive car doesn't mean that they're well off just because they have a big home doesn't mean that they're well off. And on the flip side of that, maybe they, they feel jealous of you or envious of you because you don't have those things. Yes. Right? You don't have the responsibilities that are inherently involved in those and having those things, right? You don't yeah. have the the pressures of job, you know, a high paying job. You don't have the pressures of family or responsibilities or all of that stuff. Maybe you drive a, you know, a beat up 1973, you know, um, I don't know, Ford F-150. And they they love Ford F one fifties from the seventies, and they wish they had one themselves because then they know that they don't have any car payments, and they know that the truck works and it's great and perfect, right? Right, right. So it, you just you just don't know. Comparison comes from the stories that we tell ourselves about our own worth, and and I think oftentimes, you know, that's where it becomes like we said before problematic. Yeah. Is, is just make sure that you're crossing the T's and dotting the I's when this stuff is happening, right? And actually, let's get into this really quick. Um, so um, what can you do if you're feeling comparative? Or more importantly, what can you do if you think that the comparison feelings are becoming problematic? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, 
One, I'm just going to address the one where you were talking about the jealousy piece being a demonstration of love and comparing the, your partners as this person doesn't experience jealousy and this person does. And so I'm, I'm worried here with the person that doesn't experience jealousy. Um, if you don't experience jealousy and you have a, a heart to heart with your partner and they, they share something with you about I'm feeling threatened because I'm not sure that you care about me. Find other ways to reassure them. Be intentional about that. Recognize that your lack of jealousy uh, is something that they habitually look for because of their programming. And so meet them where they're at. Don't expect them to be different. Don't say you got to go fix yourself because that might take a lifetime. Say, <laughs> you know, okay, I hear that. I don't experience that. And so I'm going to uh, be really mindful about how often I, I spend time with you and let you know, I love you in these ways. Huh. Yeah. So that's one thing. So that just be, yeah. So just because you don't understand what the person is experiencing, don't just be, don't be dismissive of it. Yes. Validate, 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 validate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, recognizing your own uniqueness. And we say this a lot with a lot of clients and people, Sometimes mm -hmm. people embrace it and sometimes they don't, um, but it's true. We're all unique. There is not another human being on the planet that's like you. Mm -hmm. um, even if your partner so, has a type. It's, <laughs> yeah, even if your partner has a type, right? Yeah. You know, um, it, it's it's true that that there's still not another person on the planet like you. Even if they, Even if you've got a doppelganger out there and they're dating that doppelganger, there's still not another person. On there. There's still unique qualities about yourself. So one of the things you can journal do is journal. What are your what uniqueness do you have? What what value do you have to yourself? What are some of the things that make you unique? Um, you you like X, you like Y, you like Z, you like you know you like um, I, I don't know I, whatever it is. Like for me, one of the things that makes me unique is is I am a, a, a somewhat of an a music encyclopedia. Um, I, I know a lot about music. I know a lot of what I consider to be interesting facts about music, specifically music of a certain generation. So for me, that, that makes me unique. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to say, sorry, I have to interrupt that my, our elderly dog is a little bit whiny. So I apologize if you can hear him in the background. Right. That means that he probably has to go to the bathroom. So we'll speed <laughs> this up a little bit. All right. Okay. Um, so the next... Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so about, more about uniqueness, though, the next thing is, is that you can ask your partner what they think is unique about you or right. what they love about you. Um, I actually have a list up here, <laughs> right here of things that that for. So this was two years ago because this is my 52nd year on the planet. Things that she <laughs> loves about me. Yeah. Right. And I have it on the wall right here. She gave this to me as my birth. It was one of my birthday presents that year. She and meaning I me. Love this. You. Yes. I fucking love this. Because it, it is a reminder of, of how she sees me in the world. Yeah. So when I'm feeling jealous or when I'm feeling like I'm comparing myself to her other partners, I remember, I remind myself about these things. So that's actually really, yeah, that's a helpful tool to have. Like ask them to write an email of all the things that they love about you so that you can refer back. If they're not available for that co-regulation when you're feeling like you're insecure and spiraling, right? Mm -hmm. This is one of the tools that you can employ is having a reference. So yeah. ask for it yeah. and ask for those reassurances on a regular basis. I mean, we're really good about that. You and I, I love that about our relationship. If one of us is feeling uh, like you said earlier, wobbly. <laughs> you mm. said that uh, before the podcast, feeling wobbly. If one of us is feeling that way, we can say, I need a hug. I need cuddles. I need time. Can we, can we sit down together? Can we do something together? Can we go for a walk? We can come to each other with that. That wasn't always easy for me. I didn't like that level of vulnerability. Even when we first started dating, I had to really lean into that and trust that you were going to want to do those things. Um, and if you didn't want to, you would tell me and kind of rebook for another time when it was better for you. Mm -hmm. Right. So consistently you've done that through our relationship and that really helped me kind of feel like I could ask mm -hmm. right so it's a two-way street with the reassurances if someone's asking for reassurances and always being told no 
that's not going to help them feel safe asking, right? Or if they're made fun of or mocked, oh my God, here we go again, you know, that kind of disdain, not good. So try to lean into that with your partner and be like, I hear what you need. I want to show up for you. I just can't right now. Can we, can we book it for later tonight or tomorrow? Right. Right. Yeah. And on the flip side of that, if the reassurances that your partner are partner or partners are asking for are too much for you, you need to be honest about that too, yeah. but not in a dismissive way. So you can, you can be like, look, I hear you. You need reassurances. I get it. But for me, it's becoming too much. Yeah. So how can we, how can I help you give yourself more reassurances? Like maybe write down a list yeah. and I can, you know, here, here's a list of all the things that I love about you. Here's all the things I think are unique about you. And you can carry that list around with you. So it's like, I'm there with you all the time. Yeah. So you don't have to ask me so much, right? Because it is uncomfortable for me, or it isn't something that, that, that I want to be doing with you all as much or as often as you appear to need me to do that. I'm, yeah. I'm okay doing it once in a while, but but it's been too much. Right. And that's okay. I heard you just now redirect yourself away from saying all the time. That's again, one of those hyperbolic statements where we're like making it black and white. This happens always. Right. right, right. Yeah. And that's, that's honestly, that's, that's my BPD showing up, right. That black and white. Mm -hmm. thing. It's, a, it's a trait of borderline personality disorder is, is everything is all or nothing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, something is all or nothing. Not everything is all or nothing. But something... <laughs> that's, that's a double whammy. <laughs> yeah, right. Everything is all or nothing. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah. So, but yeah. And those are kind of those little ways that we check ourselves. Right. And, and then you could ask yourself, so are the reassurances, are, is me being asked for reassurances actually too much? What part of myself is resistant to it? Why am I resistant to it? What does it tell me about myself? What does it tell me about my relationship? What does it tell me about my partner? All of those things are really valid questions to be asking yourself before you have that conversation. So that when you yeah. go into those conversations, you can say, hey, look, I've done some, some reflection here and this is what I'm capable of offering. And this is how I'm capable of offering it to you. Yeah, right that's now, really great. I could change, that can change in the future. But right now, this is where I'm at. And so here's what I can give you. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about how that can help you and what, what else you might need that's outside of my scope of comfort. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Right. Um, focusing on yourself, your own hobbies, what you're good at, your accomplishments, um, nice things that other people say about you. You can also get other people, lots of, sorry? Of other people other than your partners. Yes, yes. So family and friends, um, you know, lean into those relationships too and get some, some reassurances about your own uniqueness and capabilities from them. That's now, another way. I, I do, I do want to jump in and put a caveat in on this. Okay. Because I've done this myself and I've seen other people do it as well. And that is, is they become too focused on themselves. Mm -hmm. They, they, it, they, instead of using it as a way to feel empowered in their relationships and show up and be present, they actually use it as a way to do none of that. They use mm. it as a way of, of, of distancing themselves from, from being present in their relationships. Right. And so yeah. you can get too self-focused. You can become too, um, well, yeah, you self-centered really. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, and then that, that's not, that's not healthy either. That's an overcorrection. Right. And so you just, you want to find a balance. You want to find mm -hmm. somewhere in there where it's like, I recognize my own value, my own worth. I don't necessarily need external validation. If I get it, that's great. That's fantastic. I like pretty things. Tell me I'm pretty. I'm good. I'm happy. But if you don't get it, that doesn't mean that your worth is solely reliant on it and that you're going to go in this tail into this tailspin of, of, of self-loathing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another one that's, that's really come to my awareness recently is uh, minimize or restrict the amount of social media that you're exposing yourself to because we are constantly bombarded by ads and people who look perfect and pose in a perfect way and they they mm -hmm. they you know they they show up in this in this two-dimensional world um and they look a certain way and so then we start taking that that 
and we make we make that into gospel. That becomes the way this person is, and I want to be like this person. I want to look perfect like this person looks. Yeah. And then you can take that and you can start unconsciously translating that or externalizing that into your relationships, right? I don't look like this person that just came up on my feed that can lift, you know, that can deadlift 420 pounds, right? And so mm -hmm. then that makes me feel less worthwhile. Like it makes me feel less, period. It's that so worst then, piece. Yep. Right, exactly. But instead of sitting with that feeling of less, I then externalize it. I then transpose it onto my partners or my metas, mm. right? Right. I feel less than this person because they can climb a mountain and I can't. Right, or I feel right. less than this person because they can run a combine and I can't, right? You know, those mm -hmm. kinds of things, right? So those are the kinds of things that we have to take a look at yeah. and, and really get curious about. And I know for me, when I started doing this work, which was fairly recent, I started to realize I actually like myself heavier. I like myself a little chubbier, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to look like those people anymore. I know I can look like those people if I choose to, but I don't want to. And that's a, an active choice that I'm making. And even if it is an active choice that I'm making, I still get bombarded with all the reasons why that's not a good choice for me to make. A book recommendation about that is Your Body is Not an Apology. Yeah, God, it I love that phrase. It has a workbook as well. Um, yeah, so I'll right. put that in the notes for the, for the episode. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. I just think it's really important that we become mindful of how much we use social media and try to minimize it because it does have these unconscious impacts on the way we see the world around us. Specifically, mm -hmm. as it relates to comparison, it's huge in that regard. Yeah. And then the last one is IFS work or internal family systems work or parts work. So uh, the idea is that we all have parts inside us that influence our behavior and they come up and are triggered in different circumstances. Um, the part that's activated for most people is usually referred to as the critic when we're talking about comparison. So that's the part that will bully us a little bit for not being like our metas or like someone else that we see on social media or, um, or like our former selves, right? Why aren't you better than that? Um, and so when you're, when you're working with your parts, you can have conversations with them. You can inform them about, Hey, this is, this is my new capacity and this is, I'm working on accepting it and, um, where I need you to do your job is maybe be, uh, helpful in motivating me to, uh, I don't know, take care of myself, right? You can, you know, step forward and say, hey, let's make sure you get your nap today because I need a nap every day. <laughs> don't skip it just because you're feeling good right now um, because later you'll regret it, you know, that kind of thing, right? So the critic can be kind of updated into more of a helper and less of a comparer. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. And to that point, actually, um, in Jessica Fern's new book, Polywise, mm -hmm. which we're apparently promoting heavily today, um, I think this is the second or third time we've mentioned it. Um, yeah, it's a great book. <laughs> it, it is a fantastic, it's an amazing resource. Uh, it's my favorite resource right now for all things related to non-monogamy, but relationships in general. Anyway, yeah. um, she actually does, she actually gives you um, a couple of exercises that you can do in the book. I think it's in chapter two. Um, and it's uh, it's about parts work. It's about internal family systems work. The first one is called love you, L-O-V-E, and then new word U, the letter U. And then the other one is ease. Um, I highly recommend that you, it's, it's probably the best, simplest explanation that I've seen for parts work. Mm -hmm. um, and I've done parts work before. But doing parts work with this particular explanation and the way she guides you through it in the book is profound, mm -hmm. really is. So I highly recommend getting the book and reading those parts, or at the very least, looking into it online somehow, some way to, to find out um, how to do that. And of course, you can reach out to, to either one of us and we'll, you know, it's, we can help you guide, we can guide you through that too, as part of the work that we do with our clients. Absolutely. So, yeah. 100%. For sure. Um, you said it was the last one, but actually I have one more. Oh, do you? Okay. came to mind. 
I just have one more that came to mind. Minimize information sharing. Yes, because you right? can't Often, compare if you don't know right. X, Y, and Z about your exactly. meta. Exactly, right. So if you don't know how big your meta's dick is, then do it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> on the flip side of the coin, though, <laughs> yes. if you're one of... <laughs> <laughs> and the flip side of the coin, if you're one of those people that needs that information in order to be able to manage, that's fine too. But maybe you don't need that information after all. Maybe it's not really relevant to your life. You just think it is because that's the way you stay in control. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I find I find most people who feel the need for more information are either trying to demystify their meta so that they're less of an enigma. Mm -hmm. Or they're trying to justify why your partner wants to partner with them. Right. Right? There's a but, third one. And then, go ahead. The third one is, is they're trying to control the relationship by being part of it. Yeah. Or sorry, so, they're trying to stay in control of themselves by being a part of the relationship. Yeah, and that can show up as, I want status. So I'm the person who knows everything, right? Mm -hmm. Knowledge equals power. <laughs> um, or I'm going to be inserting myself continually in uh, sort of mining for information mm -hmm. so that I feel part of it. Yeah. yeah. Right. But that doesn't necessarily allow for consent from the other person. Um, they may not want you to know these things about them, how right. big their dick is mm -hmm. or or even what genitals they have. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. It might not they be. They might not might, be. Might at all. Yeah. They might not be. Um, they might be trans and not out about it. And right. so, you know, a, a lot of times you have to really remember that oversharing is a problem as well. Hmm. We can, we right. conflate transparency with uh, knowing everything or the entitlement to know everything. Just right. because we're transparent in our relationship doesn't mean you're entitled to know everything about my relationships with other people and vice versa. Yes. Right? 100%. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think it comes down to boundaries. I think yes. it comes down to what boundaries do you need to put in place in order to make your world a safer space? Yeah. And, and sometimes, sometimes that might look like. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sometimes that might look like, I don't need this information. I don't need to know that. I don't need to know what you guys do. I don't need to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> so if you're in that space where you think you need to know everything and it's causing problematic comparison, mm -hmm. then maybe try the other way around. Maybe try to go to knowing less information. Yeah. So minimize the amount of information that you get and see if that doesn't help to regulate you in some way. We're going to do a podcast on the limited information agreement, which is the one that we have in place, um, right. which I find really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. Um, there's one more on the note here. Oh, is there? Um, you, yeah. Use analogies. You, oh, this is yeah. One of yours. So use analogies that work for you. If they don't work for you, don't use them. But <laughs> they help me. I'm an analogy <laughs> lover. Yeah. It's like labels. Um, so I eat food of all different kinds and I, I appreciate lots of things about different types of food. I wouldn't compare soup with salad, right? Don't be mad at the soup for not being crispy. Don't be mad at the salad for not being warm, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> I have friends. <laughs> Your fucking soup here need to be crispy. <laughs> what kind of soup is this? <laughs> yeah, this is not crispy soup. <laughs> I ordered the going, soup. The soup's down there going, put some crackers in me, you dumbass. <laughs> yeah. I also have like uh, different things that I appreciate about my friends who are all unique and special, right? Each mm -hmm. friendship has a different quality that I value. Mm -hmm. Same with romantic relationships, same with sexual relationships, same with intimate relationships, right? I don't have to feel the same way about each of my friends, yeah. right? And why is it different for romantic or intimate or sexual relationships? It's not. Mm. It's not. So use those it's, analogies. Remind yourself. That's what I think it comes down to is, is that why is it different for those relationships? Why is it different mm. when it's a romantic relationship? You know, would you have these same feelings about somebody if they were <laughs> your partner's best friend? 
And there was yeah. no sexual or intimate really. Well, there was no sexual relationship because it, be, being a best friend is an intimacy in and of itself, right? Yeah, yeah. But there was no sexual, right? So why is that? What what's what part of you is threatened by that? What part of you is uncomfortable or resistant to that idea? Yeah. And that's really where I think you can get a lot of work done in terms of looking at these comparisons and how well they're serving you. Right, right. Yeah. Right? And one of the other ones that comes to mind for me too is music. Um, and maybe there's a, some music fans out there, but I, I used to live in a world my, of my own choosing and creating where if it wasn't heavy metal or hard rock, it was shit. And that was a very limited and restricting world to live in. Mm -hmm. And once I started to realize that most of the musicians that I looked up to didn't actually listen to heavy metal or hard rock all that often. And in fact, listen to classical music and jazz and blues and, all sorts of other kinds of, of music, I realized, wait a minute here, I'm really limiting myself. Mm -hmm. and so then I started to open my mind up and get curious about other kinds of music. And now in my record collection, I have, you know, bebop jazz, I've got classical music, I've got blues music, I've got, you know, I've got uh, R&B, I love soul, like all of this stuff, right? You're polyamorous just... in the music world. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but the reason I bring it up is because it's so expansive now. Like, I'm yeah. not a one dimensional being in any way, but mm -hmm. I used to try to be one dimensional when it came to my music taste. And I also used to be try to be one dimensional when it came to my relationships. Right. But the right. reality is, is that I am not one dimensional. I like yeah. soup. I like salad. I like rock. I like metal. I like Sepultura and I like Miles Davis mm -hmm. and I like them maybe not equally, but, but I do like them, differently. but different, but I like them differently. And yeah. they, they, they speak to different parts of me. Oh, thank you for bringing up equal. Uh, seeking equality is a, is a foundational ideology that is problematic in relationships. Mm. You any relationships, right? Equity, yes. Equality, mm -hmm. no. We want mm -hmm. to attend to needs rather than give everybody the same thing. Right. Can you, can you explain the difference? So if I have two partners, one partner who um, has only two hours every third weekend to get together and another partner who uh, has a full weekend to get together, um, I'm not going to try and recreate the same experiences on both of those weekends because the person with the two hour window We'll be cramming too much stuff in. It may not be things that they're interested in doing. They might want to focus on one activity rather than multiple. So that's just a really simple, simplistic example of mm -hmm. like, don't try and say, well, I spent the weekend with this person and we went hiking and went to a pool and we had a picnic and we saw a movie. So I'm going to try and do all of that with this person when I see them over here. We have time for a movie. <laughs> right. We might be able to watch it in a pool if we yeah. are lucky. <laughs> or we could maybe I watch it go to that movie. We're hiking. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, but don't try and squeeze it all in. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to not have the expectation of equality. Expectation of equality. Tell me about that. Well, so you're saying that one person can only give you two hours every two weeks. And the other person can give you a full weekend. Don't have the expect same level of expectations from the person who can only give you two hours and yeah. the, same pers the person who can give you that's comparison as well, right? You're comparing, <laughs> you're comparing their level of, of, and you want to try to make it equal, but it's not equal. Yeah. It can be equitable, uh -huh. right? You can give in that relationship within the bounds of that relationship in each of those relationships, mm -hmm. but you can't, but they can't. But but having the expectation that they're going to be equal is unreasonable. Yeah. Um, and it will create, it could potentially create very difficult and challenging um, uh, ruptures in your relationships. So just be mindful of that as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, great episode, honey. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. <laughs> thanks for watching. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. And remember. Choose love. And keep it kind. Peace out, bitches. <laughs> We'd love to hear your comments, questions, or topic suggestions. And don't forget to subscribe. 
And you're invited to join our Facebook group, Empowered Poly Relationship Support and Advice. You can reach out to us on our website at gregmillion.com and at leannemillion.com or follow us on Instagram at thegregmillion and at leannemillion.